Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, as you can see, we're about to start our session on simulation. I hope you all enjoyed that amazing uh, talk and conversation we just had. So my name is Danielle Susi, and I will be moderating this session. I ask that you keep in mind as presenters that you have 10 minutes for both presentation and questions and answer. I'll ask everyone to keep their video off and mute it during the conversations. I will let you have a one minute warning. I'll give you one minute warning when it comes close to your time. So with that said, welcome everyone. And as it's 10.02, we will get going with the first slide presentation. And this will be by, but if we can move to perfect, if we can have the Educating Family Medicine residents ready to go, uh, I'll ask you to begin. And thank you everyone. We look forward to your presentation. Uh, okay, can I go ahead, Danielle? Yes, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Aaliyah. I am a uh, emergency medicine resident through the Department of Family Medicine. Um, today, I'll be discussing um, my project that I worked on with our program director, Dr. Eric Hannell, as well as Dr. Kevin Dong. Um, the title of our project is Educating Family Medicine Residents in the Acute Care Setting, uh, the Role of Simulation and Behavioral Team Training. And I'll just start off by giving a little bit of background um, that sort of um, sort of gets at why, you know, this is important and why we, um, uh, why we develop this sort of program from a simulation perspective. Um, so family medicine residents in Canada um, participate in simulation-based simulation training in limited and variable amounts. And this really just depends a lot on the residency program. Um, some programs will have maybe a half day or a day that's dedicated towards simulation. Um, but again, that's very variable as to um, from, from program to port program. Um, at the same time, though, we know that family physicians go on to care for patients in a wide variety of practice settings, um, and, for, and many of those um, physicians will go on to work um, in, in places like urgent care or in the emergency department, um, where they do need to be very comfortable uh, managing acute presentations um, that uh, patients present with. Um, simulation offers a safe environment to apply and develop knowledge and skills that are necessary in acute care, as well as crisis resource management. Um, and so in preparation for the 2019 uh, simulation Olympiad competition that was held um, in Vancouver, BC through the Family Medicine Forum, uh, we invited uh, family medicine residents at McMaster uh, to take part in a simulation program consisting of a mix of both high and low fidelity simulations over a two month period. Um, and these were organized once a week for two, two hours for a span of uh, two months. Um, and, and in this project, uh, in, in this poster, I'm just going to talk about um, the principles that we used in preparing family medicine residents, of which there were six that uh, participated in this program, um, and uh, also speak to some of the qualitative data that we obtained through surveys. Um, we also did um, collect some quantitative um, um, sort of Likert scale uh, type data, but I think the qualitative data is more interesting to present or speak to, um, and is really the stuff that uh, isn't gonna, is going to inform future programs uh, for simulation um, in family medicine, hopefully. Um, and so, um, as I said, uh, simulation tra training days were organized uh, once a week, approximately for two hours for a span of two months. Um, prior to simulation training, um, we had specific cases that were designed by staff physicians um, or our champions with a vested interest in simulation training to adhere to the objectives of the College of Canadian Family Physicians. Um, and this is just a table here that you can see that sort of speaks to the um, breakdown of the uh, different simulation cases that we um, had our residents participate in. So we started off with sort of orientation, ACLS, um, and sort of crisis uh, resource management basics. ACLS is something that um, most residents should be pretty familiar with as they would have just um, recently uh, completed the ACLS training course prior to starting uh, residency. Um, and then from there on, we touched on um, other um, important acute presentations such as pediatric life support, uh, neonatal resuscitation, trauma, and then, you know, trying to um, be mindful of all of the different settings, again, that family medicine residents and physicians will go on to practice and keep uh, uh, incorporating some office emergencies, uh, management of asthma and COPD exacerbations, ACS, um, and then sepsis and coming back to some eMERGE with some talks, uh, for example. And finally, we has um, some more intensive preparation when we were on site in Vancouver, um, sort of like a dress rehearsal. Um, and um, 
and I mean, this is the list of uh, cases that we presented um, or we went through, uh, but these, these cases were really selected to stimulate common emergency medicine scenarios. Um, and then we also had the luxury of using um, some of the facilities that were um, at the general, at the Hamilton General Hospital um, to, uh, to allow for a really high fidelity simulation experience. And that included um, using uh, high quality mannequins uh, with fully functional equipment monitors and simulation technology. Um, and then as far as the debriefing, uh, we really um, stress that. So with the crisis research management um, skills such as effective communication, leadership, resource utilization and disrupt disruption management uh, were really emphasized to foster optimal um, teamwork. Um, and we trained uh, our residents to uh, really provide concise summaries of resuscitation efforts, alert each other to critical changes, um, and to pause to take deliberate timeouts for critical procedures and to sort of facilitate situational awareness. Um, as far as our results and what we gathered uh, from our residents part that participated in this program, um, there are some sort of overall arching themes that emerged. Um, first of all, um, residents um, felt that simulation cases should be in keeping with family medicine specific postgraduate training learning objectives. Um, and I think it's really important to note that, again, we invited uh, residents to participate in our program. Um, and so a lot of these people that ended up participating were very emerged or um, um, sort of geared towards or interested in uh, managing sort of acute presentations, but this doesn't necessarily reflect the sort of general family medicine resident um, population. Um, and one of our um, participants had said, you know, this is appropriate for EM minded residents, but would definitely be too challenging for the general medicine, uh, gen general resident uh, population. So um, I think some um, careful selection of uh, future um, cases will be important to make it more topical um, to the family medicine uh, resident um, in general. Um, they also spoke to the importance of the debriefing process. So after each case, we would always debrief. Um, and that was an opportunity to speak to some of the ways that we could improve on crisis research management, some, some of the behaviors that um, sort of played out throughout the case. Um, and um, this was uh, reiterated by a number of residents, but they said that this was a vital part of learning, um, discussing our cases, especially in areas to improve. Um, this was invaluable for professional development regarding the CRM skills. And then again, I sort of touched on this, but they also felt that debriefing was um, a really important opportunity to review high yield learning content as it related to the management of an acute presentation. Um, and we really tried um, to not focus on every single thing um, that could be improved upon um, or you know how what a perfect simulation looks like but a couple of really topical um, high yield points to take away from as far as managing a particular toxidrome for example or a pediatrics case using the Braslo tape for example um, and um, that was sort of recognized um, by the participating residents where they had said that that, that part was a key component of simulation it allowed for refl reflection um, on case progression and a higher level discussion around the case for further learning. And so um, going forward, um, as we look to inform uh, future um, uh, simulation programs in family medicine, um, we recognize that, um, you know, uh, the, there are more opportunities in simulation training to be had um, in family medicine. And um, this is something that family medicine residents would like to see. Um, as far as, you know, future programming, um, I think it'll be really important to uh, really delineate clear curriculum goals and objectives that are to, that are targeted towards all family medicine pillars as part of increasing its applicability to all family medicine residents. And we did probe further um, with our residents to ask, you know, what what all, what other sort of topics would be relevant. And there was a huge um, range of topics that really reflect the breadth of family medicine as far as breaking bad news, um, you know, palliative care emergencies, obstetrical emergencies, for example, that of course, um, you know, we couldn't cover in like a two month period, um, but perhaps over a longer um, time course, um, some of those other topics could be incorporated. Um, and finally, uh, we really recognized um, how important it is to ensure that debriefing um, is incorporated perhaps in a semi-structured way as part of developing CRM skills and emphasizing really key learning points without inundating people with all of the perfect things that could go into the perfect simulation um, just to take take away um, some key points for our residents. Um, that's all. I'm not sure what time it is. Much time. You, hi, you have about uh, two minutes for questions. Okay, perfect. Yeah, if there's any questions, then I'm happy to take them. Thank you. I'll ask you to raise hand and it'll take me a minute to scroll through everyone.
some positive feedback in the comments. Uh, can't find the raise hand button. Uh, Bashir, Bashir, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, no, sorry, I was looking for it. So um, thank you for your talk and thank you for sharing your project with us. Um, my question is, um, I understand that you actually uh, took EM residents and I understand if they were overwhelmed because obviously they will have their own CBD objectives to fulfill. But um, my question is, how much do you think they actually need to be involved in EM education and EM simulation practices? Like if you take your project and your results, how much do you think that uh, you and your um, co-investigators would you recommend that your like uh, the simulation practices should actually be implemented in other specialties, not just uh, family medicine? And why do you think that's important? Like, why do you think that the current curriculum that they're actually exposed to is not enough for them to be to actually cover those um, skills? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, in family medicine, we're afforded the opportunity to, of course, like rotate through emergency medicine to become a lot more confident and autonomous. Um, but I mean, um, as someone that's an eMERGE now, I think it's it's often like feast or famine as far as what kind of presentations you actually do get to see. I mean. Sometimes I feel like myself, I'm like a white cloud and I just haven't had the opportunity to see certain presentations that are still important for me to, um, to know about how to manage. And I think that's the same that, that goes um, or is applicable for uh, family medicine residents as well. You know, you may just not be lucky enough to ever, um, you know, see someone that presents with a lithium toxicity. But, you know, in, in the family medicine role, like that is something that we're managing or should be able to sort of like pick on or, rec or pick up on or recognize, um, for example, or, you know, even managing an asthma exacerbation. Like you may have you know, very quiet um, family medicine clinic, or you may never actually, you know, have to manage that yourself and emerge. So to offer people that opportunity to um, take what they've maybe read about um, in their textbook or in their, you know, sort of didactic sort of teaching and um, actually have a, a chance or an opportunity to sort of have that play out and manage it, I think is very valuable for uh, residents. Wonderful, um, thank you. That's all the time we have now for questions. I will ask that we move on to the next presentation. Wonderful, and if we can have the next presenter ready to go. Thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is Leanne and I'm a third year medical student at Mac. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Nalji and we are presenting on behalf of other authors of the study, uh, Dr. Kainers, Dr. Ring, and Dr. Sibold. Um, so our presentation today is called The Simulation Roadshow, um, Insight to Simulation for Continuing Professional Development. Um, so in recent years, simulation-based education and quality improvement really became quite diversified and insight to simulation involves simulated scenarios that occur within the practice settings that really utilize the team structures, equipment, and resources within the practice settings. It's basically like a trial run. And these help unveil the latent safety threats, LSDs, which are modifiable factors within the patient care units that lie dormant but can emerge as a danger safety threat uh, within emergency situations. Um, and these timely identifications within the simulations can often spark quality improvement, improve care providers' knowledge, and uh, strengthen teamwork. So here we describe a simulation roadshow between geographically dispersed blend of academic and community hospitals. Uh, so it might be easier if you follow the illustration that in the center, um, but at the Joseph Byrne Hospital in Burlington, uh, we brought over 70 in-person interdisciplinary simulation experts and participation participants uh, from seven different hospitals who were divided into hands-on teams such as um, ED, PEDS, OB, and ICU teams who function in the emergency department, operating room, and ICU, as well as a group of remote observers who viewed the simulation from a conference room via Skype feed um, using a mobile device that transmitted to a projector. And uh, the scenarios included an emergent delivery, uh, a neonatal resuscitation, and a postpartum hemorrhage that followed the patient uh, from ED to operating room to intensive care unit. 
Um, and each case was about an hour long and they were chosen uh, due to their interdisciplinary nature and uh, numerous transitions of care. Um, and towards the end, after all the simulations, uh, the participants um, took part in the workshop on planning interprofessional simulations. And uh, debriefing occurred for each case group and non-local participants who watched the simulation via Skype fee, as I said, and uh, several LSTs were identified between groups and discussions around how these LSTs could be implemented at their individual institutions were also encouraged. And the LSTs and corresponding suggestions for quality improvement were basically grouped into four common themes, um, including process, medications, equipment, and communication. So I'd like to share a couple of examples under each theme. Uh, under process, um, in recognition of the challenges around paging teams, it was suggested that having a code delivery um, in the emergency department that allows paging of the RT, NRP team, and the L&D team simultaneously will be a value. And in addition to allow for multidisciplinary collaboration and possibly unfamiliar practice settings, um, implementation of a massive hemorrhage protocol to offload cognitive burden in the OR or the ICU emerged as an option for future quality improvement. Um, and there were some issues around the location of postpartum hemorrhage medications, um, and that was brought up during debriefing, and it was suggested that when the L&D nurses come down to OR or ICU, they could bring the postpartum hemorrhage kit uh, from their floor as they joined um, other, interdis other interdisciplinary teams. In regards to the equipment, uh, maintaining the equipment such as the bear hugger, training personnel to use the equipment, and uh, placing instruction sheets uh, to again offload cognitive burden uh, in acute crises were suggested to mitigate possible LSTs. Um, and lastly, a few communication issues were brought up across the board, uh, one of which included timely introduction between the teams. It was felt that establishing a mechanism to introduce each other to facilitate collaboration between the teams was crucial. Um, and in addition to that, uh, charting was another area that was highlighted as a missed opportunity to reduce redundancy and offer clarity. So as such, several important LSTs came up from the group discussions, uh, really paving the way for uh, quality improvement initiatives. Um, and a survey was administered to quantify the participant's satisfaction with the simulation vote show. Um, and overall, it revealed positive overarching responses. So out of uh, 26 participants, 20 people answered the survey and 100% of our respondents indicated satisfaction with teaching, process, and debriefing part of the simulation. Uh, moreover, 95% agreed that content was relevant to their practice, and another 95% said that the simulation helped generate discussions on possible LSTs in their own institution. Uh, so in conclusion, the Insight to Simulation Vote Show that we demonstrated at the Joseph Brown Hospital uh, utilized technologies to live stream Insight to Simulation to offer debriefing exposure and definitely pulled resources for LST identification and training. Um, and the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the re need for regional adoption of clinical guidelines, uh, collaboration, rapid staff training, and unified approaches. So therefore, uh, this rapid innovation um, achieved high participant satisfaction while really serving as a catalyst for more regional partnerships, including the Golden Horseshoe Simulation Network and the Mac Care Simulation Forum. Uh, so we'd like to acknowledge our mentors, collaborators, and JBH simulation committee members for their contributions and guidance. Um, and if you have any follow-ups or questions, feel free, uh, please feel free to contact us at the uh, Twitter handle listed below. Um, thank you. And I'd like to welcome any questions from the audience. Great. We have about three minutes for questions. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. So raise hand if you can. If you can't raise hand, then you can pop it in the chat if you have a question. And if it's really quiet, you can just pop in with your question. Okay, I'll have a, a question for you if no one um, has one right now. Um, so as a learner, can you tell me your greatest takeaway from the experience? So not so much the work you did, but your engagement with the work? Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so your question is sort of my takeaway from this. 
Yes. So your self-location as a learner within the work. Right. Um, so within that, um, as a learner, it was really cool to see how, um, how the collaboration led to the identification of the LSTs. And I think, you know, identification of these LSTs can definitely lead to quality improvement initiatives, uh, which I think would be very, very handy for acute crises. Um, and uh, I felt very fortunate to be part of this project. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, I encourage you to pose some uh, questions later on. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And good luck as you continue on with your medical training. So we'll now go to our next uh, presenter, please. Wonderful. Welcome. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry, I could not hear. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Daria Uzeli Yilmaz from İzmir Katip Çelebi University in Turkey. I completed a visiting scholar position last year at the McMaster Center for Simulation Based Learning, so CSBL. We conduct the research during this time with this amazing research team. As you can see on the screen, the topic of the research is quality in uh, standardized patients training and delivering. First of all, I would like to give you an overview of standardized patients, so SP and SP program. SP is a health person who is trained to represent a patient. SP programs are the organizational structures responsible for training and delivering SP to assist in inst uh, instruction and assessment of learnings in health science profession education. An important aspect of developing and maintaining a high quality SP program is incorporation of quality assurance processes. To achieve these goals, trainers and instructor feedback are critical. So the aim of this study is to determine programmatic and systematic issues in scope of quality assurance and improvement through trainer and instructor feedback on SP performance. Let me first give you a brief overview of the current practice for SP quality assurance at the CSPL SP program. The SP program has an active system of quality control measures in place, primarily composed of feedback forms and simulation monitoring. This means that faculty and trainers need to observe and provide feedback during or after the learning activities. We conduct our retrospect retrospective analysis at previous six years um, feedback forms completed by trainers and instructors. The form consists of Likert type section and open-ended section for the feedback. The trainers and instructors will rate the SP performance from one to five. Only the quality of scenario will rate by the trainers between one to three. Uh, so 138 feedback forms were reviewed and analyzed in this study. Descriptive statistics were utilized to analyze the rating. As you can see here, the mean of the SP, SP portrayal and quality of scenario, which given rating by the trainers, are shown ta the table in the middle of the page. The mean of quality of SP and quality of scenario rating by instructor are shown in the uh, second table. Thematic analysis of the data gathered from written feedback was performed for keys, uh, key teams emerge. Uh, firstly, nonverbal behaviors in simulation activity or feedback seasons, uh, providing feedback from the patient's lens, consistency with role portrayal and this scenario, and finally, adapting, uh, adapting easily to changing situations. So, in conclusion, component scoring on SP performance did not discriminate against all issues well, but qualitative comments identified some specific issues. Uh, we would suggest more research to provide further evidence to establish standards for continuing SP program quality improvement. That's all I think. 
Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have uh, five minutes, so lots of time for some questions. Uh, again, raise hand and someone had put in the chat, if you find it, it's in with, within reactions. If you click on it, there's a little button there that says raise hand, you can do that. I, I'll go scroll through and see if I can find you. If not, uh, you are welcome to pose a question within the chat. Okay. Looking, I have not seen a raised hand. Um, Lachere, is your question for this presentation? Uh, yeah. Yes, because um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I think everybody appreciates uh, that you guys are actually sharing your projects with us. Um, so you did a retrospective analysis. My main question is, um, just from a methodology like standpoint, do you think it would have mattered if this was prospective? Yeah, <laughs> dear Abdullah, uh, thank you for your question. But um, English is my second language, so sometimes oh, I can't explain. I'm sorry if I can email in the box now. You can send me this question. Can I can explain for you? Is it okay? I'm so sorry. No, yeah, yeah, that's not great. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Is my email is here? Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, here. Thank you. Sure. Wonderful. Excellent. Now we know how to uh, reach out to you if there's any further questions. Is there any other comments that uh, we can share? If not, I encourage you to reach out through the email provided in the chat. And we will uh, move on to our next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Arden. I'm an internal medicine resident at McMaster. And today I'll be presenting on, on Handover of Care, a, a novel interprofessional workshop for junior learners. And I'd like to thank my co-authors, in particular, Dr. Matt Sibyl for um, supervision and Dr. Zeli Ilmaz for her support with the in-person um, data collection and analysis. So to give some background, it's well established in the literature that handover is a critical time for patient safety. We know that clinical handover requires communicating complex, often time sensitive situations to other professionals and even handover within one profession. So physician to physician, um, nursing to nurse is a high risk time for medical errors and for sentinel events. Um, handover can take a variety of different forms. It can be handing over an entire list of patients at the end of a shift, or it can be handing over a specific um, change in the patient status or transitioning from one area of care like the operating room to another like the PACU. Uh, we know that interprofessional handover, which happens across all of these um, scenarios, is especially vulnerable because we're taking all the challenges that come with communicating complex information under pressure with disruptions, and then we're asking clinicians to do so across professional lines and cultures and languages. And this leaves really a lot of opportunities for misunderstanding, for misinformation, or um, miscommunications. Um, to compound this, uh, interprofessional handover often ends up being taught on an individual basis within the clinical setting. So from a preceptor to a student or within a specific team um, in the hospital. And this compounds the issue by introducing a high degree of variability in how handover occurs across different practitioners and then across different professions. We also know that in interprofessional handover, there are power hierarchies, there are differences in communication styles, there's differences in ways of thinking and knowledge, and then also high staff turnover um, between um, different professions that contribute to really um, unsafe or incomplete handover, again, which we know is tied to patient safety in critical events. So one area that's been developed pretty robustly over the past um, several years to address this is structured handover tools. Um, the idea here being these help mitigate barriers to effective communication by providing a clear format to follow, standardizing the information given in handover, and giving a shared mental model for both the person giving and receiving handover to follow. Um, these have been uh, fairly well established in the literature. There's a fair amount looking at um, how, to how best to use these tools, how to teach them across different practice settings, and particularly a lot of simulation-based workshops um, within one profession. So using SBAR for within nursing handover, um, using SBAR or similar formats for physician to physician handover. 
Um, and like I said, SBAR is kind of one of the most common um, handover tools we use, which breaks down um, handover into four component situation, background assessment response. And I'll talk a little bit more later about how that fits in our workshop. Um, but there's really, when it comes down to it, there's a fair amount of literature that shows that um, unit professional simulation-based workshops on SBAR have been found to improve um, attitudes, confidence, and willingness to use these tools um, within single profession handover. We also know there's, um, within the literature, there's good evidence for simulation-based workshops for interprofessional communication um, across a fairly wide variety of contexts. However, um, these communication workshops tend to be integrated as part of a longitudinal curriculum on team function. Um, and a good amount of them actually target, um, again, specific practice settings, established teams, or um, clinicians who are already in practice. Um, when it comes to the pre-licensure settings, so looking at students who are um, still in their undergraduate level of training, um, this is a population where, again, these learners often kind of learn uh, how to give handover very haphazardly from an individual preceptor, from observing how someone else does it. And this is a population in an area that actually um, is beneficial to target, um, especially around the time of transition to practice and given the importance of interprofessional handover and given the challenges that they might face. However, learners' time is limited. We all know this. There's often a lot of logistical barriers to IPE. And with this in mind, um, we raise the question of whether a single brief workshop on structured handover might be a helpful intervention to target um, learners around this time of transition to practice. And there really aren't many studies that examine the effectiveness of a solitary brief interprofessional workshop on improving handover skills. And another gap that kind of emerged in the process of developing the in-person workshop um, is that uh, certainly um, with the disruption to the traditional in-person model caused by COVID, there's an, uh, really not much around how we can actually effectively teach virtual um, interprofessional um, teach interprofessional handover virtually. So with all this in mind, um, we aim to assess whether a short simulation-based handover workshop improves confidence with interprofessional communication and handover among junior learners and also to determine on whether outcomes and learner satisfaction were preserved with transition from the in-person to virtual workshop setting. So to talk, um, just to go over briefly what um, SBAR is, SBAR is a structured handover tool that um, allows uh, whoever is given handover to break it down into four key components. The first is situation, so an overview of the patient name, um, the reason why you're calling vitals, a key background on the patient, which is targeted to the reason for the call, assessment, which is your overall impression um, as the caller, what you think the problem is, and finally, a recommendation or request for action from the person receiving handover. And we designed a two-hour simulation-based interprofessional workshop. I'm deliberately designed to be, again, brief, easy to um, fit into an evening session um, for learners. And the workshop was structured by doing a brief introduction to simulation best practices, the SBAR tool, and on um, principles of interprofessional education. Then learners were divided into small groups of three to four and rotated through four stations, followed by a group debrief. Each individual station was structured around a case, meaning a specific objective. So we had cases on um, a deteriorating patient, um, so communicating urgency, patient safety event, um, so a patient having a fall, a critical incident, so communicating handover on a medication error, and then patient advocacy in the context of post-operative handover. And cases often required by directional handover between medical and nursing students and often ended with a final summary being given to um, a senior physician who was played by the facilitator. Um, stations were facilitated by internal medicine residents and ICU nurses, and our participants were primarily first and second year medical students. So targeting the time of transition to clerkship or early on in clerkship and third and fourth year medical um, nursing students um, targeting around their time of transition to clinical or consolidation placements. Um, the workshop uh, interprofessional objectives were from the CIHC framework, focusing on role clarification, interprofessional communication, and interprofessional conflict resolution. And we had content objectives around SBAR handover, communicating urgency, and how to promote a culture of safety, for example, advocate, advocacy, escalation, and questioning an unsafe request. We ran the workshop for two sessions in person. This got canceled due to COVID, and then we pivoted to virtual workshops this year on Zoom, running two further sessions with identical content between in-person and virtual. So we recruited our participants from the medical and nursing students who um, participated in the workshops. Um, we had a total of 18 medical and 12 nursing students from the two in-person sessions and 26 medical and nine nursing from the two virtual sessions. We did um, pre and post test surveys using a five point Likert scale, look asking about perceived confidence participating in interprofessional handover and workshop satisfaction, just post test. And then we also asked participants to identify the aspects of the workshop they perceived as most helpful. So when we look at our results um, for learner satisfaction, scores were um, similar, um, 4.6 for in-person, 4.5 for virtual. Um, so um, really no, no, no significant difference there. And for both in-person and virtual workshop, learners perceived confidence participating in interprofessional handover increased um, from 1.8 to 4.1 on the five-point scale for in-person, and then 1.7 to 4.4 for the virtual. 
Her workshop feedback learners identified in particular the opportunity for repeated practice across stations is helpful, which was facilitated by the small group size. The interprofessional feedback from peers and actually the ability to observe how other learners gave and received handover um, in addition to just practicing themselves. So, you know, this really shows that a single, um, quite short, just two hour interprofessional workshop is effective at improving confidence with interprofessional handover among junior learners, showing this may be a helpful low barrier intervention to build these crucial skills around the time of transition to the clinical setting. Um, certainly a helpful next step would be to look at um, content knowledge and retention or reassess learners experiences using SBAR and clinical practice down the road. So whether their confidence translated actually to action and integration of um, the material um, and similarly, the fact, you know, outcomes and satisfaction were similar between in-person and virtual workshops. And I think in part, this is because the content and objectives of the workshop were really congruent with the strengths and limitations of the virtual space. And in particular, communication-based workshop lends itself well virtually in terms of fidelity to the workplace. Often these handover events take place over the phone. Um, there's a movement towards Zoom interprofessional rounds during COVID. So um, it, it's really a, something that can work quite well virtually. And this is helpful because we know there's logistical barriers to IPE, and this is an area where virtual workshops can certainly shine. So in conclusion, a um, single session novel simulation-based handover workshop improves the perceived level of comfort with interprofessional handover among junior learners. And preliminary data does show that a virtual alternative is similarly effective and acceptable to learners. And further research here will be helpful to better explore how we can integrate interprofessional learning into the virtual space. That is amazing timing skills. That leaves us one minute for some questions. <laughs> so again, it might be quicker if you have a question, you can speak up by the time I scroll through the participants for a raised hand. Oh, we have a question from Sam. Please go ahead. Yeah, so um, absolutely, we would consider running this um, with, you know, with the performance measure, you know, this, um, the virtual workshops were really, I'm um, just kind of piloted this year and just to see how they work. But um, I think that, you know, it would be actually helpful to get some more solid data on um, in terms of actual performance and in terms of actual, yeah, um, not just perceived confidence, but whether learners are actually integrating and retaining um, the SBAR format, because certainly the virtual workshop is incredibly promising in terms of logistics to participation. Um, it's easier to recruit facilitators and it can really be scaled up across an entire program as opposed to, I think, um, some of the in-person versions. Uh, and lots of feedback coming in through the chats. Uh, wonderful, thank you. And let's move on to, I believe, our final presentation, please. Great, and if our speaker is ready. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this presentation. I'm Lucy, I'm a second year medical student here at McMaster. Um, today we'll be talking about the use of immersive virtual reality for surgical skills acquisition. Um, I'd like to thank my co-authors and the organizers of this conference for making this presentation possible. So operating room time is limited for surgical trainees. This is due to patient safety concerns, variable case mix exposure, and also limited OR time now with increasing work hour limitations. And as many surgeons will know all too well with COVID restrictions as well. So simulation training has been used for thousands of years to complement the time spent in an operating room, either to learn the basics before the OR or to refine skills afterwards. The longstanding gold standard has been cadaveric training, but cadavers are generally expensive and they're limited by sort of ethical concerns. Benchtop models are also commonly used, um, often in the context of uh, synthetic models for minimally invasive surgery, but these are generally not very realistic and they don't provide the user with feedback afterwards. They're also static. So no matter how many times a user um, uses this, their, their skill level may plateau um, on these models. Conventional virtual reality is um, a high fidelity alternative to these, um, to these models, but they're also limited by their um, cost. They can cost um, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars for one unit, and they're also generally large, so they require a specific stimulation laboratory to um, house these devices. In recognition of these uh, limitations of conventional simulators, academic hospitals and manufacturers alike have begun to um, explore immersive virtual reality as an adjunct to supplement surgical education. So immersive virtual reality involves the use of a fully of a head-mounted 
display to um, allow the user to be fully immersed in a virtual um, operating environment where the user can interact naturally with this environment um, and sort of like perform the operation using natural hand motions. Um, IVR addresses the limitations of many of the other simulators. So first of all, it's low cost. Um, it can, the hardware costs around $500 and is commercially available. It's also very realistic and can allow for users to receive feedback and target specific weaknesses. IVR also allows for users to practice disastrous, um, those rare and disastrous surgical complications to prepare them for if those ever do happen. Um, given all these theoretical advantages of immersive virtual reality, we aim to review the current literature on the effectiveness of IVR for surgical skills acquisition. We performed a systematic search on five different databases for primary studies published between 2000 and 2021. We independently and um, in duplicate screen titles, abstracts, full text, extracted data, and assessed methodological quality using the MERS QI tool, which is an instrument specific for a medical education. We included um, uh, studies that involved medical trainees at all levels, from medical students to staff surgeons. And we had a pretty strict definition for um, uh, training. So there had to be more than one training attempt, which excluded a lot of the, uh, the single time uh, validation trials. Our initial search yielded 9,650 articles, which we narrowed down to 17 full text for qualitative synthesis. Of these 17 full texts, five were pre-post studies, 11 were randomized and non-randomized uh, trials comparing IVR to no simulator training, and one was a randomized controlled trial comparing IVR with conventional VR simulator training. 12 out of 17 articles were conducted in the discipline of orthopedic surgery. There were 307 participants overall, uh, the large majority of whom were uh, residents. And the mean MERS QI score was 11.7 out of 18, which is moderate. So today we'll just focus on the uh, training related outcome measures from the uh, controlled trials. So only one out of these controlled trials assessed participants using IVR. The rest of the outcomes were all um, obtained through uh, simulations on cadaveric specimens, uh, synthetic bone models, or live patients, which sort of speaks to the um, like real world applicability of these results. So seven of these trials uh, assessed time to completion on participants of which five demonstrated um, a significant improve or a significantly faster time to completion in the IVR group post intervention. This resulted in a standardized mean difference of 0 0.9 in favor of IVR, which um, indicates a large effect size. Five trials assess participants using global rating skills, which is sort of a single measure of um, participant competence or ability to practice independently. There were positive results in two of these five studies, with one study showing no significant difference between groups, and data was not available in the last two studies. Six studies assess participants using task specific checklists, which is um, a checklist of uh, steps that uh, participants have to perform for a certain procedure. There were positive results in four out of six of these studies with one study showing no significant difference and uh, results were not able to uh, be assessed in the last study. Three studies reported the accuracy of orthopedic implant placement and there were positive results in favor of IVR in all three of these trials. So overall data from these objective performance measures indicate that IVR can improve surgical skills acquisition, especially in comparison to no simulator training. But there is a lack of evidence comparing IVR with um, conventional VR. And there's no evidence comparing IVR with all of these other um, modalities of surgical training. However, most of these studies um, included in our um, in our systematic review did give um, the control groups access to things like written materials, video lectures, and even demonstrations on uh, synthetic bone models. Overall evidence indicates that IVR would probably be most beneficial to residents as well, uh, just due to them making up the largest proportion of participants and residents also requiring a lot more uh, practice to achieve competency. In the future, we're hoping to um, see larger, more long-term clinical trials in the context of surgical residency curricula, and also trials that assess um, more patient-important outcome measures. 
So that concludes uh, my portion of the talk and I'd like to welcome any questions. Wonderful, we have uh, a few minutes for questions, so please. Um, hi, Lucy, my name is Savannah. I'm one of the general surgery residents here at Mac. Thank you so much for your presentation. Very interesting stuff. Um, one thing I just wanted to clarify, and I'm so sorry if I missed this, but what, what is the real difference between IVR and VR? Like, is it really something tangible or is it something that maybe you can elaborate for us? Yeah, that's a great question. So conventional VR is usually displayed on um, like a flat screen, whereas IVR can be worn on a user's like face. So IV so conventional VR is often used for um, procedures like laparoscopic surgery, where in an operating room, the user would be looking at a screen. Um, but for certain procedures like open procedures, um, IVR is generally more useful because like normally, like the surgeon would be affected by everything that's going on in an operating room in sort of a more three-dimensional sense. So IVR allows users to sort of like move around a lot more naturally um, in their environment. And it can also simulate a lot of the, um, a lot of the, uh, like the distractions within an OR, which adds to like the cognitive load of a surgeon and can affect their performance. Um, mm -hmm. There's also studies that show that like fidelity, um, like, leads to greater improvements in surgical training, probably because of like the all of the additional like cognitive load that is placed onto users when they're using these like high fidelity simulations. Yeah, and also just to note as well, another advantage of IVR over conventional VR is that um, a lot of like these IVR devices um, have multi-user um, like functionality. So um, like a staff surgeon, for example, can be in the same, virtual environment as um, like a trainee surgeon, even if they're like, you know, like geographically separated, which can allow for a more cost-effective training, especially in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic era. Mm, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I, I think it would be interesting because you mentioned the control groups were typically people that were given access to other resources. It would be interesting to see whether IVR provides a significant improvement in training and training outcomes for compared to people who do the more quote unquote traditional training where, you know, the first time they do a skin to skin gallbladder, for example, is in a real person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Like, I think, um, like a lot of these trials are limited by the fact that like the comparator isn't like it is like conventional training and that they have like in some of them have in person sessions like videos, um, like papers, but it would be great to see like um, IVR be compared with other training alternatives. Fantastic. We have uh, technically one minute left. So I will open the floor for questions. I do believe there's one that uh, Bashir had for our first speaker, a follow up question for later. Uh, Bashir, did you want to go ahead with that one for the first speaker? Yeah, I'm just going to read it off the chat myself. Uh, so yeah, um, so the, uh, regarding the first presentation, I believe I had a question about family medicine and um, why you actually believe it is essential for those skills to be integrated. Do you think that family medicine is perhaps too specialized because you went through the residency yourself? And do you believe that it should be a bit broader or a bit more immersive into like uh, with these principles? And how feasible is it to actually have those simulation sessions? Hi, Bashir. So I, um, I think I addressed the first question as to um, why I think it's important to have sort of have simulation to sort of allow uh, family medicine residents the opportunity to become more comfortable with those acute presentations. Are you asking something else or? No, I guess, um, I guess my question would be like, how feasible actually like is it to actually have those simulation sessions? I mean, I think, um, you know, we were sort of roadblocked today as were, I think, many of these simulation programs from a COVID perspective. Um, but I think it is certainly like very feasible. I mean, in a two month period, we covered a number of topics as far as, um, you know, pediatric resuscitation, office emergencies for like asthma, COPD, um, you know, status epilepticus, like those kinds of things. Um, so I think that if this were a more longitudinal curriculum, um, I think um, this could certainly, like there could certainly be a huge breadth of topics that could be covered. Um, something that we talked about going forward was um, involving, you know, more family medicine stakeholders and champions. Um, 
that um, have a vested interest in sort of simulation education, specifically for family medicine, um, and from a wide, you know, range of family medicine type backgrounds to sort of inform uh, the future curriculum. But um, I don't think that, um, you know, uh, incorporating these different kinds of uh, simulation um, is uh, in any way making family medicine too specialized. I think that it re really just speaks to the breadth of family medicine where, you know, you have folks that are doing palliative care, like OB on the side, um, Emerge, of course, palliative care, I, I think I mentioned. So I think, um, you know, ensuring that people have that opportunity to sort of, you know, become comfortable and competent to manage some of these things, I think is totally within uh, the realm of family medicine. All right, thank you. That was Thanks. great. <laughs> I want to thank all of our presenters today. There's some amazing work being done and I wanna thank each and every one of you who joined us. Um, right now it is 10.52 and you should be on break until 11 before the next uh, sessions on curriculum health policy. So thank you everyone. I encourage you to reach out to the presenters to continue your discussions and I hope you have a fantastic day. Uh, well done to the speakers. <laughs>